Hello and welcome to a new video in our series on Agile Challenges and today I have here with me uh, Peter Hilton uh, who has uh, very interesting things to uh, share with us about technical documentation and not only. So welcome Peter. Hi. Uh, before we go into topics like technical documentation and your recent job as a product manager. Um, what can you tell us about you? How did you start uh, programming or getting into this industry? How did you end up in Netherlands? <laughs> Things like that. I guess the early years um, didn't seem very directed at the time. Um, I, the short version is I, like a lot of us, uh, you know, way back when, dabbled in writing code as a teenager, but not in mm -hmm. a serious way. Um, when I was a child, I thought I was going to be an engineer. It sounded cool, but <laughs> I sort of realized just in time before going to university that I can't do anything physical, you know, no, <laughs> no hardware problems. Yeah. Uh, so I studied mathematics instead, because that's just a way to avoid choosing what you're going to do later. At least it was in my case. Um, and by the time I finished university, I, I sort of discovered that a career in software development might include international travel and fun things, and it sounded kind of cool. And I'd done a little bit of um, computer science at university, first year course, just for something different to do. And so I ended up working for a big IT consultancy straight out of university. The international travel didn't happen for three weeks, and then suddenly I was in Paris for half a year, which was a lot of fun. And then since then, um, I guess the, the you know the big pattern over the last twenty years, well more than twenty years since then, is that I've gone for a lot of variety. So I've not really specialised. I've, I've I spent the first few years doing lots of different things in different countries. In the last twenty years, I've been based in the Netherlands in Rotterdam, which was great. Um, but also done lots of different things there. So I've been a software developer in a very broad sense of the word. And indeed, as I mentioned, I. I'm now a software developer in such a broad sense that I don't write code anymore because I'm working as a product manager, which is a business role <laughs> rather than a technical role in my case. Yeah, I remember we met at ITACON conference, I think it yeah, was, right. I don't know, two, three years ago. I think it was 2017. Yes. Uh, and uh, your talk back then was, and you had a lot of focus on technical documentation, and you actually also had a workshop there about right. this. So, so let's dive a bit into this because technical documentation is the thing that all developers know they should be doing, but nobody likes to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I got into it ac accidentally, I suppose, and, and and the most important thing I discovered that I liked it accidentally. Um, at school, I hated writing. You know, essays were the, the worst possible punishment because you couldn't cheat by just knowing the answer. You had to actually do some work. There was <laughs> no way around that. Um, and by um, by sort of 10, 15 years ago, I was working in quite a small consultancy where everybody did everything. And I sort of started to see that, you know, there was some writing that was just kind of necessary. And I also was getting into open source um, projects a bit more. And so... I can't remember quite how it started, but I'd always been interested in, in sort of different kind of writing for my personal website. Things like cafe reviews, you know, things that we needed online before TripAdvisor was invented. Um, and at a certain point, it just seemed natural that I would start writing tutorials. Um, tutorials how to do something with this open source framework. Particularly because I worked for a company too small to have anybody working in marketing, right? We just had programmers and director, nothing in between. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe a company should market ourselves with a technical blog and so there should be some content. What should I write? And I discovered that writing tutorials was kind of a popular thing. And if you pick something niche enough, then nobody else is writing about this. So you get you get traffic, right? This seemed to be quite rewarding. I would get, you know, feedback on stuff. Um, and of course, the, the blog posts, the technical blog posts were kind of the, like the gateway drug. And so I ended up doing more ambitious things, maintaining documentation on an open source web framework. Um, and ultimately co-authoring a book with two colleagues that was kind of that escalated um, which was great experience although it takes way too long right no one's got time to write a book um, it's a wonder what any of us do uh, so it's just one but I didn't do that again but it did make me then discover that technical documentation was you know a more respectable thing and and that there was a lot of value in it so of course at this point having done it enough I'd learned to like it as well 
Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, now we are striving a lot towards writing code that is expressive. At least that has been one of my major focuses and uh, with, with the people that we are training, we try to push them in that direction. But it's also quite obvious that you cannot document everything in the code. Right. While the code has the advantage of being um, uh, maintained, while documentation you often forget about it, but the code has this advantage, but it's not enough to, uh, to document. So what, what would be like a good additional documentation, even if you have very good expressive code, what would be useful? So I think, just I'd like to say, I think this is a super important question because Agile Software Development has given us a lot of kind of principles, mm -hmm. um, but not actually answered this question very much. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly things like the Scrum Guide don't mention documentation. Um, but if you apply the same principles, then where I think you end up and where I've ended up is that you, know, you do what you need, you, you iterate on what you've got and you avoid waste. What you end up with then is, is minimum documentation. You end up with very little but not none. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we knew in the 80s and 90s, I mean, I started working in the 90s and I, I saw these projects with enormous waterfall development and massive documentation, um, huge amounts of waste, and also it's super boring, nobody wants to do that. But no documentation at all is bad in a different way. And so what's the, you know, for me, the eye opener was to realize that the middle ground is not somewhere halfway between the two. The middle ground is almost none. You know, if as a software developer you're spending 10 minutes per week writing documentation, then that's plenty. You know, you can get a lot done. What does that mean? Um, open source projects who have, you know, the constraint of generally being maintained by programmers who don't want to write documentation discover that you get a long way with a well-written readme. That's probably 90% of what you need. Um, often interesting software has one interesting thing about it, and by interesting I mean complex. You know, if you're lucky, there's only one bit of necessary complexity in a better software. And so often you have the sort of the introductory documentation that gets people started, like the readme, the, the overview. And then maybe one other thing that explains the complex thing. Um, I've worked on many kind of business applications where the data model ended up being super complex. Mm -hmm. And so if you got people started and you documented the data model, you didn't need anything else. So typically, you know, the basics plus one. And, and the, the, the additional thing, could well be something else. It might be a process explanation or a process diagram even. Um, it might be one of the types of UML diagram, although, I mean, I don't really mean that because I've never seen UML in the wild. Although I have heard of people who, who swear that they've you know, seen industrial UML for real, not making it up. Um, and, and sometimes it's, you know, it's detailed troubleshooting or support instructions. Um, you know, whatever, whatever you haven't managed to automate yet. Um, assuming that you will automate it and make the documentation unnecessary at some point. Yeah, I remember some types of documentation that we really liked to have in my projects. And one of them was, especially when you expect many new developers to come in the team, is this how you set up your environment, how you make it work, how you, what dependencies do you have, what configuration do yeah. you need, all these kind of things. But then it was also uh, indeed things like uh, the, some words about the, the code, how it's structured, what are the patterns, what are you know, some of the key features. But in addition to that, it was also like, if these weird things happen, then <laughs> try yeah. that. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, the troubleshooting stuff. And so that's, that's where it gets much harder. Things like troubleshooting and, and I guess what you're describing, how is it structured? The, the technical architecture. Um, I've never really been satisfied with you know approaches for documenting architecture, usually because they often sound good or the documentation is, you know, it looks nice or something. But it's very hard for it to also be useful. It's very hard for it to be what you need. Um, and so I think that's why, if you focus on value, if you if you apply an agile method to documentation, then you'll end up really focusing on what people need on day one on getting started because that's the thing that everybody needs. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you've gone into any depth into a system at all, one person needs that once a year. You know, you, you, you go down the rabbit hole very fast, very, very deep. Um, and it's hard to make stuff that's generally useful because documentation is expensive. You know, maintaining documentation is like maintaining code, but without automated tests. 
yeah uh, that's one of the challenges we indeed and actually that's one of the arguments against having comments in code they just document the code because you often change the code but you forget to change the comments and it's yeah so i have, I have pretty strong feelings about strong opinions about comments and code which get me into trouble um but i guess i also like trolling coders a little bit um programmers will go to enormous lengths to justify not writing comments in the code and although there are you know very sort of a lot of sensible things said about comments they tend to be drowned out just by the no comments um thing and so indeed the easiest argument against is just the straw man argument of um things you know comments that entirely duplicate the code are pointless well indeed they are pointless comments you should definitely not do that um, but there are useful things to do in comments and if you're going to have if you're going to go from zero documentation at all to having a little bit then comments are not a bad place to put your documentation if you have a really small amount because it's in the code you're much more likely to maintain it there like if you can't maintain a one sentence comment in a class file then you're not going to maintain any other kind of documentation. I mean, that would be the easiest thing to maintain because it's in the code, you see it, it's subject to version control. If you can't maintain that, then indeed your only hope is zero documentation, um, which is difficult. You know, you're basically on call forever, right? Or I don't know, or you like sitting in meetings. Like, if you have no documentation, then there's going to be in meetings every day explaining things. Um, so code comments can be a very valuable way to prevent phone calls and prevent meetings and, and give short explanations um, for things about the code. Uh, but actually a lot of the documentation we need is not really about the code. I mean, you know, making the code better, you don't really need documentation about the code. That, that can be readable. Sometimes you need documentation more about the project at a slightly like higher level, like why are we even here? The code can't explain that. Um, and the gray area there is that the code can't explain why the code is there. You know, you can the code can make it clear what it does, but it's hard to know why. Why do we even have this class? It's probably not possible to write code that explains why the class exists. Um, I mean, to some degree, unit tests can do that um, if they're explaining, for example, business scenarios or use cases. So that's one of the big values there is that you no longer need the comments that say what the class is for. But that's not necessarily the case. So comments can be useful, but you know, I'm thinking about one sentence at the top of a class. I'm not thinking about you know, a comment in between every other line. <laughs> yeah, and that's, uh, I also like a lot um, comments that explain weird hacks in the code which happens sometimes because right. you, you are using an external library or service or even your code and it doesn't work as you expect and you don't have time to fix it but you found a way to make it work only the code looks yeah. very weird and i mean comments can be very useful like that as a flag you know i mean you're missing something if you're if you set your IDE to have comments in white text on a white background you know oh, no comments um i mean they should really have flashing lights and be in bright red because the fact that you need a comment should be a huge warning that something weird is going on. Um, you know, so indeed, either there's some massive refactoring you haven't had time to do, you're in the middle of some nasty hack, you've had to do something very weird for performance reasons. Um, so indeed, if you're not doing very much documentation, then the mere existence of the documentation is messy, is an explanation of some kind. Um, so it can, you know, as long as you maintain it as such. But of course, that's the that's the catch, right? I mean, you have, it's just as expensive to maintain as code or worse. Um, and that requires effort. So, oh, the comment got out of date is, is just an excuse. Like, oh, the code got out of date. Oh, it, yeah, it doesn't pass the test anymore. You can't ever ignore that in the same applies to the documentation, including the comments. Okay, so you, you mentioned unit tests, and I think it's a very interesting topic because you can kind of document behaviors using unit tests but it depends on what level you write the unit test if you write a unit test for each class then it basically it's useful in the sense that it gives you examples on how to use mm -hmm. that class uh, only one thing that i'm missing in id is is i'd like when i go to a method to actually see the examples for the method uh, because then it would be useful uh, now i have to navigate to the unit test and say ah oh, that's how it's used but there's maybe an even better type of unit test where it's not on a class level, it's on a behavior level. 
and then you can write it and say this is actually something that's business relevant. Yeah, or... and that's more like to explain why this code is here. Yeah. In practice, maybe you need both kinds, but it, and because they serve different purposes. But indeed, a, a different perspective on the code can be very useful. I think. Um, I only regret a little bit that of all of the many things I've managed to get involved in or try out, you know, exploring all of the different kinds of um, behavior-driven development, um, things like specification, by example. And um, I would have loved to have, you know, written a lot of Gherkin because that looks kind of cool because I like constrained writing, right? Um, that kind of stuff is probably very helpful, but sadly, I've, I've not tried that much. Yeah. Um, well, we have some experience with that, but even with Gherkin, there is always a question of on what level do you write those tests? Are they very... When you start, if you are doing BDD properly, then you are starting with real examples, business sure. examples, and so on. But usually, developers from Gherkin understand, I can now write unit tests in this nice format, uh, and they're still on the level of a class. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, I mean, the examples so, thing maybe is the important thing. So, uh, you know, when my colleagues and I started writing this book about a web framework, the publisher taught us to write, which was a good move on their part, mm. because the book would have been kind of mediocre otherwise. Um, um, of the many different techniques they taught us, uh, for me the most important one was that we had this bad habit of writing our paragraphs in exactly the wrong order. You know, we would start off with some kind of abstract explanation and we would go into details on how to do it. And only at the very end would we then sort of maybe think about giving examples. And it made a lot of sense in our heads, but it's completely unhelpful for the reader. And so it was a revelation for me to kind of learn and finally understand that you need to start with the concrete examples to have somebody understand what's going on. And then only then do you explain what actually just happened. And if there's some general theory going on, or if there's some broader abstraction, you explain that last, not first. And so you mentioned navigation and where the tests appear in the IDE. And this is one of the hugely unsolved problems in the way we use IDEs and the way we code is that the tools we have um, are excellent in many ways to do with writing, especially. You know, we have all kinds of refactoring and code completion, but we have very little good tools for reading. We have navigation, but it's not very sophisticated. I mean, there's not a lot new in the last 20 years in code navigation in IDEs or 30 years. Um, and indeed, presenting the information in the right order turns out to be kind of important from a teaching point of view. If you want to write a book or give a presentation, the order matters. So it probably matters in the code as well. Um, and, and teaching and learning, I'm thinking about the scenario of code maintenance, right, where you're, most of the work of maintaining other people's code is understanding it, how to learn it. So that's why I think there's a lot of potential to do better in how we present or structure things to be read. I remember you had a lot of, um, you were thinking a lot about how to structure the code for reading. That was quite interesting. And that included in typography and things like that. Yeah, well, well that's because I watched uh, Brett Victor's presentation, uh, what's yeah. it called, The Future of Programming, and realized that um, not only was he right, but he was right in a very creative and entertaining way that made it clear that many things we've not questioned for decades. And I picked up on the typography thing partly because one of the things I did at university before I knew I was going to be a professional programmer was that I worked on the university newspaper uh, back in the days when it was printed on paper and learned a bit about typography and layout from somebody who had a bit of training in that and, and got into it. You know, and typography is interesting. It's a very old topic. It's nice to get into something old alongside something new. Um, and in desktop publishing, the two collide. There's a lot of information in typography, and there's a lot of information in layout, and yet, bizarrely, programmers don't use any of that. And so this is when I, you know, one of those things that I kind of got into and you know, started discussions in, in bars with colleagues you know, over beers and, and, and discovered that I could uh, you know, start quite an interesting argument by pointing out that programmers seem to fear um, innovation and any kind of technological improvement and we're still basically using typewriters, um, not in how we write code, but how we read it. You know, I think if you look at printed or yeah, if you look at text that is not handwritten, um, fixed whip typefaces used to be used in various places. They came out of typewriters, but typewriters haven't been a thing for quite a long time. Um, 
and every use, I think every use of printed text in modern civilization has more attention to type and layout than source code, which just seems like a massive missed opportunity. You know, that mug, this piece of paper, that book cover, all of these things have have more work on the layout and typography, and it's not just making them pretty. I mean, there's there's information design going on. And yet our code, single column of text in a text file, one typeface, one font size. Uh, you know, and so if you start asking questions like, okay, syntax coloring is really, really not being very imaginative. I mean, what if you used a different font size? What if you used columns? You know, all sorts of quite basic layout and typography kind of things, you know, could mean something. Because code is extremely structured. Anyway, so in, unless you're actually gonna start inventing and, and actually coding new IDEs or whatever, take advantage of some of this stuff, then this is just a conversation in a bar, but it is quite an interesting one. I quite enjoy that. Yeah, well, I find it interesting because I came to this idea of code is like writing from a different perspective. We started doing these uh, events called code retreats, which are, you know, practical, hands-on uh, uh, events where we start writing code for a problem, we write it for 45 minutes and then we throw the code away and start again and learn in the process to improve our practices. And this format has actually been um, imported from writing, from writers' workshops and things like that. And uh, we recently also had a chat with Joe Yoder who has been a part of the design patterns community for 25 years or so. and. They also started with writing workshops. So, right. so there, there is a lot of convergence here, but somehow it doesn't seem to penetrate like in, uh, in the development mind that what you are doing is much closer to writing or much closer to producing a TV series, especially today when, um, when we are no longer limited by the technology. So when we first started doing programming, it was a lot about let's make this work on the hardware. Let's yeah. make sure that the CPU understands the instructions and so on. And then we didn't have enough um, memory to store long variable names. And that's how we end up with NV and CP and <laughs> all these yeah. things. But now we don't have these limitations anymore. So it's much more writing than it is technology in a sense. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing to, uh, you know, and this is something that's explicit in Project Victor's talk, it's a difficult thing to recognize which things are like that for a good reason, and which things are simply like that because we copied them from two generations back, and in between we somehow lost the understanding of why it was like that. Um, but, I mean, it, it sounds cheesy because it is, but there are so many areas in what we do where the limitation is our imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's fun to see the occasional new thing. Um, but there are many areas where we're not seeing new things. Um, yeah, and having, you know, proper paragraphs or <laughs> things yeah. like that, that, that would um, be interesting. <laughs> right, but, I mean, mo most of that, I guess, I, I feel is less important because, you know, we're, we're focusing on what we need to, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're building software and whatever. And so for me, the, the practical side of this line of thinking is, is actually the useful technical documentation rather than reimagining what the code looks like. Um, and the most practical thing I've ever got involved in is, is talking to people about how you get better at things like naming. Mm -hmm. Because it's about the code and because it's a hard thing and hard things are interesting and fun. Um, and because the better at it you get, the less documentation you have to write. So that's a, that's a value proposition right there. Um, you know, when... I mentioned that programmers would like to come up with reasons to not write code comments. Um, typically, the, well, the, the most common reasons tend to boil down to, well, write better code instead of writing code comments. And this is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but if you say, instead of writing comments, we're going to have perfect naming, you do what, this is what mathematicians call reducing a problem to a harder problem. You say, well, we can't solve this problem, but if we solve this much harder problem, then, then we've solved that problem. And now you're worse off, you're not, you're not better off. So sure, I mean, you need much less documentation if your naming is perfect. Um, but your conclusion from that should be that you should spend a lot more time on naming because it's hard, not that you don't have to do anything uh, because you now have a reason to not write the documentation. I mean, you know, it's true as far as it goes, provided you actually then do the work to make the documentation unnecessary. Um, but, I, you know, I read a tweet the other day describing a scenario of 
of using you know mob programming to just debate naming a hugely valuable thing to do um, of the kinds of documentation you might need if you have almost none um, I mean, I mentioned documenting the data model, but I don't really actually care about an entity relationship diagram. The most useful thing is just a list of the names, just a glossary. You know, version one, like the minimum viable data model documentation is called a glossary. Mm -hmm. And it's just anything that's jargon, like anything that you can't look up. Suppose you're doing a sort in English. You know, have, um, well, I mean, I've got a Mac, so it's got an English dictionary on it in the dictionary app. Pretty good. Any word that's not in there with that meaning, put it in your glossary. In some domains, that's kind of important. You know, I've worked in things like supply chain and finance, where there's this huge amount of jargon. Um, and so, jargon is kind of words that doesn't already have documentation. You know, you may need to write those down. Uh, and choosing the right ones is often what about getting better at naming is. It's not inventing words; it's discovering the correct word. Yeah, and I've noticed that I um, we keep um, um, doing clean code workshops and things like this and we explain to participants you know for naming you should be using the dictionary you should be mm. learning more words you should yeah. be uh, lear learning the proper words for different things because one thing that's very important in code is precision so you, right. you need to use the names you can use very long names, but then they are very hard to read. So the better names are the ones that are shorter, but very precise. And that's very hard to get to. It's Yeah, but it's something you can get better at. And so that's why, I mean, I've had this sort of similar experience in workshops. Um, I've done a workshop and sort of training on writing maintainable code. And a big chunk of that is, is making the naming better. I mean, you can get better at naming simply by just by spending some time on the problem and doing whatever comes into your head. That will... You know, I mean, that will get you somewhere, but indeed, useful things are specifically to use tools like dictionary and the thesaurus. I mean, there, there are literally books that give you all of the other words that mean almost the same thing. Very useful tool. You don't have to invent that stuff. Um, and, and to be deliberate about learning this language. So one of the reasons I got into that topic was, um, I mean, for many years in the Netherlands, I would be a developer on a, soft, on a software development team, and I'd be the only native English speaker. And so some things are easier if you just know more words, including writing the documentation and the comments. And <laughs> turns out your colleagues are happy if you volunteer. Um, but, but learning to get better at the naming is, is, is kind of either it's just learning more English. You know, reading books helps. There's often a word for the thing you're trying to describe, but maybe less common um, you know, than what you're used to hearing. But also your subject matter domain is you know nobody knows what it means and it doesn't matter what your native language is you know if you're suddenly doing healthcare insurance um you know you have no particular advantage of a native english speaker you don't know what words mean either maybe it's worse because you don't realize you have no idea what they mean you think they know what they mean um, and so deliberately learning stuff is is the same kind of thing you know if you remember learning a foreign language or if you've done it more recently then deliberately learning vocabulary is is one of the things you do um, and that's the same for getting better at naming. Um, and so once you start kind of thinking of it in those terms, then you realize, well, it's just a practical thing. Like learning a foreign language, you know, the easiest way to do it is to just grow up with it and learn it before you thought about it. But the second best time is now, and there's books and courses for that. And you can do the same thing with programming topics. Um, although I guess there's less specifically books about, you know, um, ubiquitous language for supply chain management. <laughs> um, but, you know, the Wikipedia page on the topic comes close. Yeah. It lists, it's got all the terms in it. You know, so that's, that's, and that kind of practical idea is, you know, one of the things that's, that's about documentation and naming and therefore code at the same time. So, I mean, that's what I always end up coming back to is, yes, you know, I'm interested in this technical documentation and how you document code, but it's not a separate thing from the code. If you think it is, then you're doing it the hard way. Um, yeah. Okay, so we discussed about naming, discussed about comments. How about commit messages? Well, it's the same thing. And so, again, you know, I've, I've read fascinating blog posts about describing, you know, you should absolutely not write comments in your code. I mean, that would be a complete waste of time. But then going on to suggest writing 100 word commit messages. <laughs> um, it's the same thing. I mean, I personally, you know, have a preference but don't really care about where the information goes 
So that's the thing. It's the same. It's the same thing. You know, you maybe need to describe some things. So that's describing change rather than describing state. Both work. Um, pros and cons, fine. But indeed, you probably don't have both. That would maybe be a bit weird. You know, you're either having kind of descriptive code comments describe, for example, what a class is for, um, or you're describing the changes in commit messages. But that can be very useful because then you can learn about code by kind of replaying its history. So a certain kind of commit message lets you do documentation not as a like a static document. It's like event sourcing, but for documentation. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to kind of, you've got this little journal. And so if you're new to this particular source file, you just have to kind of load the journal. And that just means read all the commit messages in order. You know, and then you load it all into your head and then you probably understand the code far better than if you just look at the current version. Um, so, so that works too. Um, personal preference is a good enough reason to choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. right. right. So then um, what about the other types of documentation? So when you're doing things like documenting architecture or documenting kind of the core features of your code or design patterns in your code that yeah. you often use, uh, do you... Would it be a wiki would be useful or kind of Word document or it depends on how large the documentation yeah. is? What's... I've used a whole kind of series of kinds of systems for, for documentation and it's kind of an interesting topic. It also risks, you know, as soon as you ask programmers about documentation systems, there's a huge risk that they want to suddenly build their own. Um, how many wikis and documentation systems came out of teams who were just avoiding working on what they were supposed to work on? I'm guessing all of them, 100%. I think that's probably where they all came from. Um, I mean, wikis, uh, which means lots of different things these days, are very, very useful. But it's kind of weird to me that after this kind of the original wikis, most of the so-called wikis these days aren't wikis in the original sense of wiki syntax and automatic linking between pages if you use the name in the right format. Anything else is just a bunch of pages with search, but a bunch of pages with search is is hugely useful. So a word processor is totally the wrong thing. It's got to be shared, it's got to be collaborative, it's got to have search. Um, but most things, I mean, I don't even have to name names, you know, it just become overcomplicated. And the thing that I was very happy to replace, you know, the usual word processor with became the usual wiki. Um, and it was great, you know, I've got a wiki instead of a word processor now, it's collaborative. But then it just sort of became super complex. And so probably the state of the art is to really go for the bare minimum. Um, and for a lot of people, that's markdown files in GitHub in the same repository as the code. Very searchable um, because you have a clone and you've got, for example, command line tools or whatever you use to search for stuff. That can be a very useful kind of way of structuring stuff. But mostly for that kind of documentation, like architecture documentation, my plan A is to not need it. You know, I'd much rather cheat um, in that unless a clever architecture is you know, a key part of the value of this software rather than somebody else's, then I'd much rather use somebody else's standard architecture and then I don't have to document it. So there's lots of things wrong with overusing frameworks, for example, but the most important thing about a framework, and I've done a lot of web stuff, so suppose a web framework. A web framework, maybe its most important feature is that it also represents other people's documentation. You don't have to document all of the things that they document. You just say, we do the usual thing. Um, there's been a whole se sequence of uh, sort of frameworks and technologies for building applications and framework this and framework that, that the value for the people using it was not these, you know, the extra facilities it provided, you know, you can distribute your code or whatever, but the fact that it gave you a standard model or a standard pattern for writing your code. And then you can just use naming to refer to it. And so the best thing about design patterns is book. The book is documentation you don't have to write, right? So that's the, the most spectacularly amazing thing about it. If you, if you get the names right, you don't have to explain, you know, what a factory is anymore because that's now become jargon and it has documentation. Um, so I'd, 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 you know, in general prefer using that kind of documentation because it's sort of free, not exactly free, but it's cheaper than writing your own, cheaper than rolling your own. But for the systems, you know, simplest. Um, and I want to go back to the wiki thing because you just reminded me that there's, let's call it the great wiki mystery. Um, 
many software categories have a compelling open source implementation and maybe com commercial variants, whatever. But somehow there's never quite been a compelling up-to-date recent wiki implementation. Um, there was a time when there were lots of different wikis, but most of those are decades old and not maintained now. And so, you know, if I decided I literally wanted um, a wiki as my corporate intranet and I wanted to just install it myself, you know, there's, there's no obvious open source software that would be that installation. There's no obvious kind of wiki that would do it. There are lots of things that are being more than that. There are lots of you know, quite complex software. Um, you know, there's things that expand to be GitLab or they, you know, GitHub and GitLab. There's things that expand to be CRM systems and whatever, but like just the documentation part, I'm not sure what that means. It might mean that it's not interesting enough a problem to just solve that. Hmm. Yeah, so I've used in the past, I used DocuWiki, which was a good, not a good tool, but I don't know, it kind of missed something. I cannot exactly point out what it was. But today what I'm seeing the most is um, documentation in a conference. That's very common, yeah. uh, which is good because it also links with Jira, let's say. So I'm not a big fan of these tools, but they are widely used, so you can have these types of documentation. And um, another type is, uh, as you said, the documents that are part of the source control. And to me, I like this much more because then uh, at least we can maintain the documentation in the same place where we maintain yeah. the code. You can remember easier the indeed it's, and... it's 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 more feasible. Um, I mean, wikis like Confluence work pretty well, provided that you have a librarian mm -hmm. who's going to go around and keep everything tidy. And if you don't have a librarian, then hope that at least you have a a gardener or a, you know who's going to behind the scenes kind of tidy things up. Because if you don't, it will quickly become um, either unusable or everything will become unfindable. Um, and even then, naming matters, page titles. Or SEO, as it's called in the other other areas, um, but it can have advantages like being readable by a much larger audience. You know, and so I see recently with code markdown in the in the source repository, not everybody can has access to that. For example, who in your organisation does not have a GitHub account? Um, do they need to be able to read this stuff? If it's documentation about the code, that probably is not a problem. But as soon as you sort of start getting into other kinds of documentation, it is. And then you end up with two systems. The one for the coders and the one for other people, and you've got to draw the line somewhere. And so you can get into all sorts of problems here. Um, so we're still not in some kind of ideal situation, even for what is potentially a fairly simple problem. And I remembered actually there's a third very common way of documenting code, which is swagger. <laughs> Swagger's not a way of documenting code I at know. all. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is a very common tool that people use to, especially with microservices now, and so you have REST APIs, and then yeah. Swagger seems to be very convenient to, to write so, these kind of things. On the whole, I've not worked with microservices architectures very much, but a fair amount with REST APIs. And, and what I love about the idea of microservices is all of this extra API documentation to write, which I like, but maybe nobody else does. Um, and then there's Swagger, which is largely a tool for not writing API documentation. Um, I mean, apart from kind of rare counterexamples, Swagger installations tend to just not contain any English sentences. There's no actual documentation there. So Swagger is layout and it's structure, but it's not actual documentation, you know, words and spaces. Um, and so Swagger solves a particular problem, but that problem is not documentation. You know, I'm willing to kind of redefine the problem so that I can then claim that there's no such thing as generated documentation. You can generate page layouts, you can generate structure, you can generate navigation. These are all useful things, but you can't generate the words and the spaces. You can't generate the actual explanation. And so in principle, Swagger might be harmless, but unfortunately it's not harmless because it gives the, the illusion of being in the process of documenting something. Um, and then before you know it, the developers, instead of writing the words and spaces to explain things, are writing some custom conversion from annotations in their code to generating the JSON that Swagger reads when they could actually be documenting their code. Um, 
Um, I'm not, I don't take Swagger too seriously because I note that none of the people who sell access to their API, people, you know, companies whose API is part of their product, um, none of them use Swagger to document their APIs. Mm -hmm. The best API documentation is things like the GitHub API and that kind of documentation. It's definitely not Swagger. And it's probably maintained using a custom in-house built CMS because that's kind of inevitable once you've got programs involved. But by the same token, it could just as easily be handwritten HTML or Markdown. Um, yeah, so go figure. So I, Swagger is a distraction, I think. It's, <laughs> for me, it's not interesting. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing that I, uh, I started doing recently, and I don't know if you have any experience about, with that, um, I was looking into practices of other engineers so non-software engineers, like proper engineers, <laughs> as you engineer. might say. <laughs> and um, one of the practices is taking very detailed notes. Uh, and I, I started doing that, and it, it proved to be very interesting. Because, for example, as po in Mosaic Works, part of my job is to manage the infrastructure, but I don't always have time to do the complex procedures for upgrading or doing the various things all at once. So then what this has provided me is, I'm going into my notes, I write precisely what I do, I do the steps, and I also create a procedure, basically, to mm -hmm. what's the next things that I need to do, what's the next things that I need to do. So I can always come back and reread those notes and say, ah, oh, so that's what I tried, this didn't work, so now let's try this instead, and I already have my resume point, basically. And it doesn't take me long, it takes me probably 10 minutes to write a detailed note of what I've been doing, but it saves me a huge amount of time when I go back into that. So, I think I know what the interesting thing about these kind of notes is, um, which translates to software architecture, so it's a nice analogy. Um, the interesting thing about these kinds of notes is that they are write-only. You don't edit them. Um, not only are they write only, but they're probably identified by timestamp. Okay. Um, so I've, I've not done this all the time, but there were projects I worked on in the past, especially when I was working in some kind of chaotic environment and switching between doing application support and then application development and then sitting in other people's meetings where I would literally have a desk diary, you know, one of those things you get at conferences. And every day I would write the today's date and then everything that happened, every command I typed, everything that was new, I wrote it down. No explanation, but the stream of consciousness of my day as whatever kind of software developer I was that day. And that can be very useful indeed, as you describe. Um, but what's clever about it is that because it's write only, it costs much less effort than every other kind of documentation. Because in all kinds of writing, especially in books and novels and fiction, but writing is mostly editing. I and mean, that's why it takes so long to write a book, because just like software, you know, you write, you, you, you write 80% and you do 80% of it, and then you do the second 80%, right? And then you're still not done, whatever. <laughs> Um, I mean, that was, you know, for me, a harsh lesson of writing a book is when you've completely written all of the text, you're less than half done with the project. So cutting out the editing part is a huge time saver. You need some way for it to still be useful because it's unedited and raw. So that's navigation, hence the timestamps. Um, again, it's like an event sourcing analogy. You know, you just, just write the journal. And occasionally, I mean, I've read the odd blog post about this idea for specifically for documenting technical documentation and software development. And it's not something that maybe works for everybody. I mean, some of us as kids wrote a diary, but it's not something that's universal. I suspect, you know, some people kind of quite like it and some don't. But if you happen to not hate it, then it's it can be amazing and useful. It's like this sort of superpower. And you can freak people out in meetings by saying, well, actually, six months ago on such and such date, you know, we uh, flip through, I found it somewhere. I mean, it helps if you've got some kind of photographic memory and you can remember what it looks like in your diary and find stuff. Um, and I've done it as a consultant where um, I love Moleskine notebooks. He does them, oh. right? Um, and they have these kind of softback notebooks that are A6, same as a passport. And uh, if, you, if as an external consultant or a customer, you walk around carrying the red one and you write in it in a red pen, then first people think it's your passport. You know it's not the right color, but still. Um, and then second, kind of people wonder what you're writing in it. And so you know, build up this air of mystery. But no, it's really just writing the journal, 
maintaining lists, you know, writing lists of questions, you know, checking things off. And if you're, you know, any, any kind of fluid environment, then it, you know, it needs to be on paper. Um, I'm not doing that at the moment, but for the same reason. I don't quite do the daily journal, but I do uh, write a lot on my iPhone and on my Mac in the Apple Notes app. Mm -hmm. And I have many, many lists. So most of the notes are lists of things, things that I don't have to remember. Mm -hmm. Great use of documentation. Mostly short to remember everything. Um, but lots of them, are, each heading is a date. You know, it's some kind of ongoing topic or project or whatever, and it's just the latest interaction. It's weak because it's personal, so I don't share any of this stuff. It's the raw notes. But any other kind of documentation I write often starts there. So it's often source material. So you know, I, I love hearing this, that it kind of works for other people, but I, I suspect not everybody else gets the joy of journals. Yeah, well, it would be an interesting experiment to try to write a journal of, not necessarily about task or the minutia, but more about you know, I tried this, didn't work. Now I'm trying this. Yeah. So the next thing to try would be this. This is kind of the the kind of notes that I end up with, but they are extremely, extremely useful. Yeah. And, uh, it's, I hugely advise people to, to try them. So it's a shame I can't remember the blog post. Maybe I can look it up later to find it. Um, describing and recommending a very deliberate practice of writing a certain kind of journal, um, just to kind of write down everything as a personal thing. One of the thing, one of the ideas that kind of gets rediscovered every now and then that's related is is architecture decision records. Mm -hmm. um, although I think it's more popular to kind of refer to the blog post than to actually do it, because actually doing it, it's not quite as obvious as it looks. But it has that same property as of write only documentation to document things that need documenting. In this case, decisions, things that are hard to figure out another reason. And the recommended structure there even more has that property of being like. An event log where you know you can read into the project by reading through them all in chronological order, especially if they're written nice and concisely, if they're mm -hmm. short. Um, although I kind of feel that architecture decisions are not the decisions that we most need documented on most <laughs> software projects. So I think the kind of decision record that I would most like to see would be the agile retrospective decision record where mm -hmm. you know at the end of each retro you kind of document the decision you've made in a, in a similar way as a write-only thing. So that everybody, you know, who, who joins a team can figure out what version of software development is this team doing, right? Because inevitably, if you're doing anything that's genuinely agile, it's 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 unique. Um, you know, in theory, and this is just a simplification, but in theory, if you started your project with a Scrum guide and then you documented your decisions, then anybody who wanted to understand what you could, were doing could start by reading the Scrum guide and then reading all your decisions. And then they would know what your your thing is, and that would be much easier and more maintainable than trying to kind of update your version of the Scrum Guide every retrospective. You know, mm -hmm. Nobody's going to do that. It's completely unrealistic. Yeah, I mean, we are using a few practices with teams in this area, and one of them is uh, the social contract, which is basically a set of rules that people follow and that get introduced only as needed. Mm -hmm. So things like uh, don't be late at meetings, yeah. and so on. But you don't start by, you know, for every team, say, don't be late at meetings. That's not the point. The point is, if we see at one point that people are late at meetings, let's have a conversation yeah. at the retrospective about this and so on. And then if we need to, we add a new rule. Maybe we move the meeting at another time yeah. and it doesn't happen anymore. Maybe we need a rule. Uh, I mean, but in that case, it's more like a permanent contract that you kind of keep very visible in the room and so yeah, on. Yeah, it's, so it's kind of like a constitution, I guess. Yeah. And, and that does make it interesting. But I, I sort of worry that you have to be careful to not reinvent the need for lawyers. Um, <laughs> and the, the most successful approach to that I've seen is to you know not do what countries do, which is only add laws and then create these huge yeah. stacks, but have some limit, like, you know, there can be maximum 10 things on the list and you can mm -hmm. add things to the list but you have to work out which one you don't really need anymore yeah which which may work because you know once something's been on the list for a little while then you don't need it anymore yeah it gets into the habit after a while and then yeah. uh, you don't need to talk about it anymore and so yeah we try to keep them very small but um so let me ask another question uh, going back to technical documentation and how writing is 
is a skill in itself. Uh, writing proper documentation, capturing even these small things, like there was a meeting today about an architectural decision, but how do you document that? Because yeah. you, you need some way to document. These are the things we discussed, these are kind of yeah. the options, these were the arguments and so on. So it's not yeah. easy, it can be complicated. So if you are, um, if we are talking with a junior developer who wants to go do a good job and can write good code and things like this, but now, you know, this would be a plus, writing proper documentation. What, what advice could we give someone like that? Um, so what I wish I'd known 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> I think there, there are two things, but they're kind of the same thing. The first thing is about the fact that it's a problem we all have in specialist jobs, in specialist roles. Programmers are not immune. We sort of assume that everybody else's job is not that hard and kind of easy and that there's no real expertise. And as, for example, a programmer, it can be a shock to discover that, for example, the designers or the chef in the canteen or whoever in the organization has studied things and has technique and has abstraction and can, can explain what they do and they have process and all of the things that we do. We thought they just did the thing and they just made it look easy and we assumed it was easy because they made it look easy. But, you know, learning to make something look easy is generally quite hard, whatever it is. So this applies to writing too. So the first big realization that took me a very long time is to realize that the difference between good writing and bad writing is, is that kind of thing. It's not either some kind of natural innate talent that some people are born with, it's, it's a learned skill, but it is a real thing. Okay? And the ultimate result here is that the person who's better at it may be worked to get there. And there are people who only do this, called technical writers who can be amazing at it at a whole level that you don't know about until the first time you work with a technical writer can be um, kind of a surprise that somebody can be so good at this thing that you just hated and you didn't realize why. Well, you hated it because you were just not very good at it. So that's the, the, the first advice of that is that it is a specific thing that some people get good at and it's not, it's not just that documentation itself is some kind of problem. It's just one of the many things that are hard. Um, and it's worth, it's helpful to be good at. And that not everybody has to be good at it. Not everybody on the team has to have all of the skills. So, you know, if you don't know who's on the, if you don't have somebody on the team who's going to be the writer, then maybe you should hire a technical writer. So thinking about that leads into the second thing, which is as follows. It's very, very hard to be the best programmer in town. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, Trying to be the best program in town is definitely a good idea. Um, but at a certain point, it, you know, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite sort of crushing, if you, especially if you realize that you're not. Um, one of the things that I've most enjoyed doing in my career that I've done many times, and writing is only one of them, is doing coding plus something else. It can be very interesting, can be very high leverage. If you're a pretty decent coder and you don't suck at a second thing, that can be useful. If you're competent at the second thing, that can be a game changer. And if you're pretty decent at the other thing, then you can be the only person in town who's pretty decent at these two things. Writing is one of the things that, it, that could be that second thing. So, you know, in my ideal team of people to work with, everybody has chosen a different second thing. Everybody has a different thing. That diversity of skills is what makes a cross-functional team interesting and, um, and powerful. So I'm not saying it has to be writing. Um, these tend to be very tedious threads on Twitter where somebody argues that their second thing is the one thing, the one true thing that all coders should do. <laughs> as well as coding, you should be an expert in writing compilers and algorithms and computer science. Or as well as coder, you should be an expert in foreign languages or testing or documentation. Or you know, there isn't literally an endless list. Um, the most useful thing you can be is the one that nobody else is, whatever that thing is. Writing is one of the candidates. And it's probably not hard on a software team to be a better writer than anybody else on the team. And if you are, if you become that person, then you know doors open. Um, so make it a deliberate choice, and you know respect the choice of other people and respect the the skill, and you know experiment. And also, you know if you decide that your number two thing is something else, it's worth 
trying not to be completely useless for all of the others. Mm. Um, the, the idea of the T-shaped profile, the generalizing specialist, this goes by lots of names. Um, and so in, in maybe including writing in that, because writing is something that's going to happen on your software development team. Yeah, so one thing that I noticed that was interesting to me is I, I love to write and I've been writing for, I was computing at some point that I was writing for probably 35 years or so, because I've always, I started writing some sci-fi when I was very young and stories and all kind of stuff. And I think one of my hypotheses, but for which I don't have a lot of proof is that by writing things, this helps you write in better code. Uh, there seems to me there is some kind of connection in, in the brain between these two things, between the ability of you know, forming a sentence that is informative, that transmits um, in a proper grammar and structure um, a certain idea to writing code that is understandable by other people. Uh, do you have a similar experience or? Um, yeah, and I, I'm not the only one. I discovered, as I discovered when I was sort of researching doing a presentation about naming things, and I was looking for advice about naming things because I didn't want to have to invent it all, and there was basically none, right? Which, on the one hand, meant I had to do some work to prepare the presentation, but it did mean that probably nobody else had done it. Um, and then I came across the idea of sort of looking at recommendations for, you know, advice to writers. Um, you know, maybe some of that, indeed, would there be some kind of crossover? So that was my question, you know, would there be this kind of crossover? Um, and I, I discovered there was in a slightly different way. Well, not only is there advice to writers, but there's lots and lots of it. There's literally a website called Advice to Writers. <laughs> um, it seems that when writers are kind of want to avoid what they should be working on, instead of building content management systems, um, they, they, they write about writing. Yeah. And, and they're writers, so it, you know more of it. So the same kind of thing, I guess. Um, and if you look at what famous writers have written in their advice about writing, and you imagine that it was a coder giving you the same advice, and you read it word for word, pretending that they were talking about code, a lot of it makes a lot of sense and sounds like a really good idea. Um, and so I, I use this as a slide in one of the presentations was there's a 1946 essay by George Orwell writing about the English language. Politics in the English language is the name of the essay. And in the end, he kind of ends up with these rules for kind of clear writing. And it doesn't require much effort to translate them to coding. And this is not weird because, I mean, we write code. It is a, you know, it's a very different kind of language, a very different kind of purpose, but it's not an entirely different thing. You know, it's not like interpretive dance where you have to struggle a bit harder to make the connection. And also, if you look at the things that we struggle with in coding, not all of them are things that compiler cares about. Mm -hmm. And again, that's, I mean, naming is the most obvious example. The compiler does not care about the naming. Um, and I, I read this description of, of writing from one of, you know, one of the great authors of literature. Um, I'm not sure, I guess maybe it was Hemingway or something. I went through a phase you know, years ago of mm -hmm. kind of catching up on what I didn't read at school. And, and the advice was, was roughly that about writing, that you don't just write the text, you write the text and then you, you agonize over every single word and you, 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 know, you, you ask 20 questions about every single word and this is the right word and you endlessly edit it and change it and try and make it just right. Code is a lot like that. You know, we, we don't just type continuously all day. You know, the, the idea that you work all day and you wrote 10 lines of code is because you've endlessly edited, you've endlessly agonized over the little details, but also the larger abstractions and, and try to make it all fit together. Writing novels is like that too. I mean, people who don't write novels maybe don't realize that. It's not like that for all novelists, apparently. Some really do just kind of bang away at the typewriter continuously. Um, but... A lot, of, a lot of what they're saying, you know, struggling to find the right word for the concept you have in your mind. That, that, that phrase is, you know, I mean, about writing, it was written about writing, but it could just as easily be about object-oriented programming. <laughs> you know, which is the, which is, what class do I need to have in order to, to express this abstraction? 
Um, so in that sense, there is a fairly obvious overlap, I think. Mm. And so there, then I'm not surprised that um, that there's this sort of quite direct kind of benefit from exploring both at the same time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a really interesting thing to see this and also to see that you can improve. Uh, there's also another theory that I know that the words that you use kind of influence your thinking. And, and this can also be part of why ubiquitous language can be so so useful uh, because you kind of dive into that domain and yeah. use those words and they start to somehow have a shape <laughs> and connect. It is uh, interesting. Okay, uh, let's switch gears for a bit. You've been a product manager recently. Uh, yeah, so as with all of the things I got into, I mostly got into product management by accident, but not entirely by accident, right? So if all of the things I switched into, like technical writing or project management or doing things in companies, I was, I was ready for it when it came along. So, you know, my, my employer asked me if I was interested in product management and did I want to be product manager for a product. Now, generally given that kind of question, I generally wanted to say yes. Um, and this one seemed like an interesting one because um, I'd started to kind of learn things about product management and product ownership related in the in the scrum sense of the role, which is not entirely what product management is, it's usually broader. And realized that it maybe kind of held the answers to some of the questions I've been struggling with as a, as a programmer. So I was quite motivated. So I think I need to explain that. Um, I've had a lot of fun writing a lot of code on a lot of projects, especially at consultancy. So when you work for a consultancy, you work on a whole series of projects for different customers. Um, I, I counted it's 40 something that I've worked on. Um, but usually this is somebody else's product and it's a bit short term, so you're not kind of in it for the long haul. And at a certain point I realized that, yeah, but working like directly on the product, maybe it's just more interesting. And so that's, that's a switch I made five years ago. Uh, which I highly recommend if you've only worked as in, in a service business to try that because it's different. But I sort of started to realize and, and look back and realize that a lot of the code I wrote on these consultancy projects was the software that was never used. And a lot of the failing of my customers' processes, and occasionally I was involved, on a process level is that we didn't really validate that the software they were paying for was needed. Now, Agile software development has helped a lot with that, mm -hmm. um, avoiding waste, but still, a lot of the Agile software development was doing pretty well on you know, minimizing waste on the stuff we were doing and making technical practices good. And these are all very necessary things. Um, but maybe failing on being sure that that particular user story needs to be there. Um, and the more I thought about it, you know, the, the more terrified I got of Okay, I'd, I'd, I'd come to terms with the idea that I'd worked on whole systems that were just never used, and just unnecessary, and that's just, that's just what we did, you know, and you can't win them all. And it was other people's money, it was their choice. It would have been more satisfying if it had been lots of users. Mm -hmm. you know, but when you're writing business software where you spend 10, 10 man years building something for five people, you, know, you don't expect the same kind of feedback as you do if you're working on something that's used by a million consumers in, in B2C. But still, a bit more kind of user interaction or actually users would be nice mm -hmm. so often felt like a bit of a gap also a problem in a process you know actual contact with the people you're building the software for so the more i kind of thought about this you know it led me to kind of product management realize well this is really the, the the discipline of of making sure that you're actually building something worthwhile mm -hmm. and and that it's not just you know you're not just making it up you're not, and, and, and with that product management mindset that I sort of got into, I looked back at stuff I'd worked on and realized that we just we were just making it up. You know, part of what we were doing, there was no product management at all. It just hadn't happened. Um, and so this seemed to be something important to try. It seemed to be you know, a way to kind of leverage my interests and my experience more than, than, than writing the code was to kind of try and do more to maximize the code not written by you know, actually learning how you decide what to build from mm -hmm. a business point of view and connect that with development. So that, that's, that's what I got interested in, and that's what interests me about product management as a, as a topic. Now, product management is, is also broader than that, so not all of it is my favorite thing. 
Um, um, and this, this is, uh, I mean, as in software development, um, e even on programming roles, there are many different kinds of roles. Right? And so finding the right one is, is tricky. But um, this, this is what is fascinating to me about product management and, and helps me understand why the Scrum product owner role, as described, is so impossible. Um, but, you know, impossible things are interesting challenges. Yeah, so there there are a few things that I that we discuss with our um, participants at workshops, and when we do coaching about this, one thing that I always explain is that you know Agile started kind of from programmers, so we wanted to not be bothered for two weeks, and then we said, okay, so somebody needs to do some work related to the product. Let's call them a product owner, their job, whatever they do. But if you look at the list of things that the product owner needs to do, it's impossible. It is like spend 80% of the time outside the, the office, but then also have stories ready for development when they need to be and be available for the development team and so on. And it's already a lot. And if you add to this marketing, uh, like market research and customer conversations and finding new areas in the market and all these things it becomes <laughs> it becomes impossible exactly yeah so to me when i talk about product owners with the specific groups of people i say yeah that's an abstraction it's it's what developers at the time understood about product uh, part but then if you look at product management there's a whole range of practices that you need to go through and the second thing that I think is very important is that happens to developers also when they switch to architects or to these roles. When you are a developer, it's, everything is kind of predictable. Uh, you, your only risk is that you know your machine won't work right that day or something like that. But other than that, everything is kind of, you write the code, it works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it's probably your fault. And then you kind of, move like this but when you are an architect um, there is no clear decision always <laughs> when you are a product manager it's even less clear you are even in more unknown it's like yeah we could go in those 10 directions which ones to pick there's no clear <laughs> criteria for saying yeah well, it's yeah it's obvious that way <laughs> Uh, and I think it's also the myth of people like Steve Jobs who are like, yeah, let's do that. But but people forget that he, behind the scenes, there was a lot of iterating, a lot of uh, work put into those decisions. So how, how have you dealt with this? Because you change a lot. Uh, there's much more risk involved, like much less information, much yeah. less... Um, so, I mean, the big thing is, is, is shifting into the beginner mindset uh, because, as you say, there are many, many practices and you can't become proficient at all of these overnight. So, step one, prioritization mm -hmm. and, 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 and try and have some kind of focus, but also try and, you know, not only improve on one thing because you're always limited in some way by the thing you're worst at. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in a role that's so broad, then that's, that's much more relevant. Especially when you're typically in a role by yourself, which is different to software development. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I've ever, as a programmer, worked as the only programmer <laughs> on, on a team. But in a way, it's like being the only programmer on the team and, and starting from scratch. So fortunately, we tend not to start programmers, you know, hire programmers and have them work by themselves with no programmer experience. Um, but product management can be like that. So learning practices and, and learning to apply them um, and, and reading a lot, talking to a lot of people, um, you know, learning to ask better questions, learning how to learn is, is the all over mm -hmm. again, but a, a different kind of thing. Um, but also connecting it to connecting it to the software development. Um, so, you know, not just having the conversations and fiddling with the charts and the plans and the analyses or whatever, but also talking to the developers and talking to the customers um, and, and keeping at least that, I mean, in, 
not only mediating, but I mean literally introducing the developers to the customers. Um, to sort of try and avoid some of the things that were situations I, I had in the past where that just didn't happen. We didn't have somebody to actually put us in the same room and, and to keep that conversation happening. So a lot of different things at the same time on a lot of different levels mm -hmm. and uh, planning for the long term. Yeah, well, it sounds very exciting. <laughs> it is, it is. And after a long time doing the same thing, it, it becomes increasingly hard to find a new thing, to find something that's exciting. Okay, so I think we're getting close to the end, but uh, if you want to add anything before we close. Um, nothing comes to mind. <laughs> um, I certainly talked about my favorite topics, like <laughs> naming things and comments. <laughs> so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So um, if you want to see uh, more from Peter, um, I think we have some of his talks recorded from my take on conference uh, in the past and uh, we'll invite Peter back uh, after he spends a while doing product management I think that that would be an interesting conversation again uh, don't forget to check out our uh, YouTube channel we are adding new videos uh, weekly uh, all these all kind of conversations around topics from software development challenges and until next time, don't forget to think design and work smart.